Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is very disturbing. It was solved just a few weeks ago and now we have all of the information of what happened to this poor young girl. It's a truly devastating case and you will see why as we get more into it. But without any delay, let's just get started. Today, we are going to be discussing the absolutely tragic case of Amber Gibson. Amber Gibson was born to parents Peter and Anne Marie Gibson, and she lived with her older brother, Connor, around different areas of South Lanarkshire. This was an area in the United Kingdom that's known for poverty, crimes, and drugs, and more than 14,000 children, or 23% of the population, grow up in poverty in that area. From all accounts, Amber had an extremely rough life from the moment she was born. Her father was physically abusive towards her mother, exposing the children to unspeakable violence from the time that they were born. Peter would punch Anne-Marie in the face, put his hands around her throat, and push her to the ground. He would drag her by her hair and start kicking her as she lied on the ground right in front of his children. But the abuse didn't stop there. Eventually, Peter would actually be sent to jail just this year for a number of crimes that took place between 2001 and 2008. This included the assault of a young boy in their hometown. According to court documents, Peter had punched and kicked this child until he was seriously injured. He was also accused of lewd and libidinous behavior towards another young boy. I don't know the identities of these boys or how they relate to the family, if at all, then he was later accused of raping another woman in their town. In that case, he tied her up, blindfolded her, and choked her. For these offenses, he is facing 10 years behind bars. But knowing these other charges just shows how violent of a man Peter was and what kind of behavior his children were subjected to from a very young age. Thankfully, by 2008, when Amber was three years old and Connor was five years old, they were removed from the home and put into foster care. They were then given to Craig and Carol Niven, and after a short time, this placement became permanent. Craig and Carol took the siblings into their home and raised them as their foster children. Craig and Carol described Amber as being the most giving, caring, loving, supportive, and admirable person. Despite everything that she went through in her life, she had such an amazing outlook on life. She loved art and singing, and overall, she was just a light in the lives of those who knew her. But soon after the children started staying with the Niven family, they noticed some behavioral issues that Connor had. He was sort of a loner, not having too many friends at school. He was known to have sudden outbursts of rage when he got upset. Girls around him at the school were very creeped out by him, saying that he was known to make some morbid jokes. He would joke about killing other classmates and killing babies, and people obviously found this very off-putting, but nobody thought he was being serious at all. People just saw him as this loner, weird kid who didn't really have any friends and was into some morbid things, but nothing really beyond that. It also seemed that Connor was well aware that he didn't fit in. He didn't hide the fact that he struggled with his mental health either. He wrote in one Facebook post, quote, bulimia, depression, anxiety, and ADHD on top. Yeah, I'm fine. People may think I'm weird, but I'm complex AF, so don't just judge people based on their outside. Try and look at them for who they are. Him and Amber also didn't really get along well. According to Craig Niven, they never really left Connor and Amber alone together because they just did not mix well. Growing up, even though they lived in the same home, Amber and Connor attended different schools. Amber went to the Morehouse Academy, located about 25 miles away from their home. Connor attended Keir Campus in Blantyre, which was a school specially for people with social, emotional, and behavioral needs. But the foster arrangement didn't ultimately work out for the family because the two siblings just didn't get along. They both had needs that the Nivens weren't equipped to handle at the time. So, when Amber was 14, she moved out of the home and into the Hill House Children's Unit in Hamilton. At the same time, Connor lived with the Nivens until he was 18 years old. Once he turned 18 in 2020, he moved out of the home and started living at Hamilton's Blue Triangle Project, which is a hostel for homeless young adults. While they were living separately, Amber and Connor still actually maintained contact, 
but their relationship was always described as a turbulent one. While living in the Hill House's children's unit, Amber continued to just not be able to catch a break. She was sexually assaulted by a 20-year-old man named Jamie Stars. This took place in June of 2021, just after Jamie had been released from jail on bail relating to another sexual attack on another woman. Just months after that, on November 26, 2021, Amber told a friend that she was excited to see her older brother, Connor. It seemed to those around Amber that she was just excited to see her brother and chat with him after they hadn't been getting along and they wanted to sort of mend their relationship. That evening, Connor called the Hill House unit to speak with Amber and to plan some sort of get-together that night. A short time after the call, Amber left the Hill House to hang out with her brother. Now, according to the house manager, she did discourage Amber from going out that night, but Amber did anyways. After leaving the house to hang out with her brother, by 9.51 a.m., Amber sent out a selfie on Snapchat of her and Connor to a friend with the caption, My Big Bro. After that, nobody had heard from Amber again, and nobody has seen her alive since. That same night, according to staff at the Blue Triangle, Connor got back at around midnight. When he returned, he went into one of the offices to speak with one of the staff members, a woman named Suzanne. According to Suzanne, Connor looked very disheveled. He was out of breath, his hands were dirty, with dirt going all the way up to his wrists. Obviously, Suzanne was concerned, so she asked Connor if he was okay, but he didn't answer. Instead, he asked Suzanne if he could make a phone call. He explained to Suzanne that he had family issues and had gotten into an argument with his sister. He said that he needed to use the phone so he could call his sister to make sure she made it home safely, and he did call the Hill House to see if she had made it home, but she had not. As it turned out, Amber would not return back safely at all. The Hill House noticed that she didn't return home on the night of the 26th, so they contacted her foster parents, who also hadn't seen her that night. And after that, she was reported missing to the police. As time passed with Amber being missing, Craig and Carol were surprised that they hadn't heard from Connor in days. They just sat and hoped and waited as police investigated her disappearance. As police started their investigation, obviously they first spoke with the person who saw her last. That was obviously Connor. Connor said that him and Amber were hanging out on the night of the 26th, but they got into a disagreement. He said that the argument got to the point where Amber started crying before Connor walked off and left her there. He said that he didn't know the area well, which was a little bit strange because he lived in that area and he was thought to have been very familiar with the area, but he said that after he left, he started walking towards his homeless hostel. As he was walking, he said that he must have fallen into a ditch, which is why he looked so muddy when he returned back to the hostel. But when Connor was asked if he knew exactly where it was that he walked away from Amber that night and where he left her, he didn't have a clear answer. Then, when he was asked where the ditch was that he fell into, he said that it must have happened at the rear of Hamilton AC's football grounds. According to authorities, though, this location didn't really make sense for where he was with Amber to walk back to his hostel. So, the authorities asked him why he was in that area, and he changed his story, saying that he actually was now running back to the hostel from a friend's house. So, not going from when he was hanging out with Amber straight back to the hostel. Now, he went from hanging out with Amber to a friend's house and then back to the hostel. When asked what friend he was with, he would not tell police. It seemed to the police that he didn't want to involve anybody else with this story who could confirm or deny that he was at that friend's house that night. But after that, they couldn't get anything else out of Connor, so they just had to continue their searches. But only two days after her disappearance, Amber was found. Her body was found naked in Cadzo Glen Park at around 10.15 a.m. on November 28th. But even her body being found isn't as it would normally happen in cases like this because this poor freaking girl just could not catch a break. Turns out, a 45-year-old man named Stephen Corrigan discovered Amber's naked body when he was walking in Cadzo Park just lying there out in the open. 
And rather than just reporting that a body had been found, this man decided to sexually assault her dead body. It's reported that he inappropriately touched her private parts, but his DNA was found literally all over her body, so he clearly did a lot of unspeakable things to that poor girl's body. Then, instead of reporting her even after sexually assaulting her body, he just dragged her remains into some bushes out of view and covered her with sticks and branches. As that was happening, police were still putting forth efforts in searching wherever they could for Amber. That is when they also arrived to Cadzow Glen Park. As they were searching that area, one officer noticed a plastic bag that was sticking out near the bottom of some stairs in that park. As he got closer to the bag, which was located on the left, he started looking around the area, and then to the right of him, across the path, he noticed a body. He said at first he noticed that the body had longish hair, but he couldn't tell whether this body belonged to a man or a woman. He said that the body was lying on its right side with the head pointed towards the path and the feet pointing towards the water on the other side of the park. According to the officer, it looked like branches had been broken off of a nearby tree and then placed against the body and then stacked on top of the body to make a pile around her. Then he noticed a pile of clothing on top of a bush that was nearby. Of course, this body did turn out to be that of 16-year-old Amber Gibson. When finding out that her body was found, obviously her family was absolutely devastated. Four days after she was last seen alive by her brother and two days after her body was found, Connor took to social media to write a tribute to his sister. He wrote, quote, Amber, you will fly high for the rest of time. We will all miss you, especially me. I love you, Ginger Midget. G-B-F-N. Goodbye for now. X. And that is a direct quote. I don't normally say that word, but it's what he wrote in his post, so I'm just reading what he wrote. Either way, around the same time, Connor reached out to a local newspaper asking for an interview so he could talk about his sister. He wrote in messages saying that he wanted people to know who Amber really was. He wrote, quote, I'd like people to know what Amber was like, the real Amber, not the Amber that people saw, but the person that she was on the inside. I'd like them to know. Him and the local reporter set up a time to meet on December 2nd at a local chip shop in Kilbride to chat but he didn't make that meeting. That was because he was arrested on suspicion of murder that same day. Now, let's go back and discuss what led police to suspecting Amber's own brother of her murder. So, after the discovery of her body, Amber was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. Dr. Gemma Kemp performed the autopsy, and she said that when she got Amber's body, she was caked in mud. She also had eight different bruises around the front of her neck, which were consistent with manual strangulation. She also had significant injuries to her head, which was consistent with blunt force trauma. She suffered a fractured nose, and her brain was swollen due to the severity of the trauma. She concluded that she suffered from multiple blows to the head. Dr. Kemp said that the blunt force to her face and head would have been enough to render her unconscious. However, it wouldn't have caused any traumatic brain injury. With all of these injuries, though, she determined that her cause of death would have been strangulation. Then, the medical examiner found that Amber's clothes, including her bra, top, bottoms, and jacket, all had significant abrasions. It also appeared that her underwear had been forcibly torn from Amber's body, so much so that they were rendered unwearable. They pretty much were completely ripped apart. She believes that the damage to her clothes are probably from her body being dragged, and then from her underwear, again, it was just from them being so forcibly removed from her. Then, police were able to find CCTV footage from the night that Amber was murdered in the area where she was last seen. First, we see Amber and her brother, Connor, walking along a bridge in Hamilton in South Lanarkshire at 9.57 p.m. They are walking in the direction of the park in Hamilton where her body would later be found. Then, about an hour and a half later, Connor is seen walking back down the road, now by himself. 
Then he stops to lean over a fence for a few seconds before continuing on. Then you see him returning to his hostel with the clothes that he was wearing that night in a trash bin before he walks over to a dumpster just outside of the hostel and dumps the clothes to get rid of them. So now we know that not only was he obviously with her on the night of the murder, but there is a lot of time that is not accounted for. But to add to that, police found evidence that connected Connor to the act itself. Upon searching through Connor's things, police ended up finding a jacket that he was wearing on the night that he met up with his sister, hanging up in his closet. So it appeared that there's a few items of clothing that he threw out, but then a few that he didn't throw out because there were a few things that they found still in his room. On that jacket, police found widespread blood staining that was mixed with mud and dirt staining. They also found Connor's shoes in his room that also had spots of blood on them as well. Of course, they sent this blood in for DNA testing, and it did match to being Amber's blood. My thought with this was that maybe Connor didn't see the blood on his jacket and thought that it just looked enough like mud and dirt that police wouldn't think anything of it. And then maybe the shoes that he had, he either, you know, those were his only shoes that he owned, or he just, again, didn't physically see the blood on them, or he wiped them off and thought that it was good enough, and police found, like, tiny spots of blood that were in, like, the crevices of the shoes. That's my thought, because otherwise you'd think that he would have thrown those items out as well. But with him living in a homeless hostel, it's not too far off to think that maybe he only owned one jacket and one pair of shoes, so he couldn't throw these things away. Whereas his shirt and his pants, he could have more easily thrown those away because he probably has more than one pair. I know growing up, I really only had one jacket that I wore for years and years at a time. So I wasn't just going to go and throw that jacket away because I literally only had one. Same thing with shoes. I literally had one pair of shoes that I wore for everything all the time for years. So just going off personal experience, I think maybe that was the case. Totally could have not been. Maybe he was just stupid, but who knows either way. Then, police also found blood on Amber's underwear, which, as I stated, had been torn and tattered. Well, that blood did match Connor's DNA. Then, police went ahead and looked at Connor's phone as well. This phone showed that on November 27th at around 12.43 a.m., he messaged to a Snapchat group that had five other people in it. He wrote, I'm really going to need you guys to help with something when you come back. I'm being serious. Then, 40 seconds after sending that message, he messaged Amber saying, are you okay? Then, by 1.33 a.m., Connor messaged his Snapchat group again saying, NVM or never mind, it's all good. Then, that next night at 11.38 p.m., the user on Connor's phone made a Google search which reads, how to get nosy police officers to stop monitoring your phone which again shows that he's not very smart. If they're monitoring his phone, why would you Google that on your phone? Because police are going to see it if they're monitoring you. Makes no sense. But either way, based on this evidence, police believed that Connor met up with his sister, walked with her to that park, and then something happened where they either got into a fight or he had planned this all along and he ended up attacking his sister, raping her, beating her, strangling her and then killing her, leaving her in that park just naked and exposed on a walking path. So, like I said, he was arrested and charged with Amber's murder on December 2nd, 2021, and he went to trial in July of this year. I do believe Stephen was also being tried at the same time as Connor, which I will discuss in just a minute. Obviously, Connor denied having anything to do with his sister's murder. 
but the prosecution brought forward all of the evidence that we've discussed this far. The fact that he was with her that night, that his blood DNA was found on her clothes and her blood was found on his clothes. That CCTV footage which showed him walking with his sister to the crime scene and then walking away alone. The clear phone evidence that showed that he was freaking out and trying to hide something that same night. They argued that Connor attacked his sister, raped her, and murdered her. Then Connor and Amber's foster parents took the stand as well. They talked about how those growing up around Connor all found his personality and the way he talked to other students to be disturbing, like I mentioned earlier. Again, he would make comments about killing people and he just had very dark interests. Then Ivans talked about how the two never really got along and that was clear when they ended up splitting into different homes. Craig also discussed about how he talked with Connor about a day or two after Amber's body was announced to have been found and he said that Connor just did not sound very concerned. He sounded like a little bit surprised, like, oh, really? but he didn't sound all that upset or concerned. They also talked about how in the days after Amber went missing and the two days that they couldn't find her, Connor didn't reach out to his parents, they couldn't get a hold of him, and it was just strange that he showed such a lack of concern for his sister's well-being. As for Connor's defense, I'm not really sure everything that they argued other than to say that they didn't know how his blood got on Amber. I tried finding more articles about the defense, but there just weren't really all that many. There weren't many articles listing out all of the evidence in general, but most of the articles were talking about what the prosecution was arguing and not really much what the defense was arguing, which to me says that the reporters either don't care about what Connor has to say, which totally understandable, or that the defense just didn't really have much of an argument to begin with. I'm sure they said that Connor wasn't the one responsible and that there was enough reasonable doubt to show that he hung out with his sister, got in this argument, and just left her there and that someone else came in and tried killing her. I know at some point they argued that maybe Stephen was responsible for her murder, but based on what we know about Connor and that night and his behaviors and all of the evidence that we discussed, that just does not seem like the most plausible situation. Connor's trial lasted for 13 days, and after that, the jury went in for deliberations. Ultimately, the jury of 15 found that 20-year-old Connor Gibson was guilty for the murder and sexual assault of his 16-year-old sister, Amber Gibson. Then, that 45-year-old man, Stephen Corrigan, again, he also went to trial, but he was facing charges of defeating the ends of justice by intimately touching and concealing Amber's body. At his trial, they discussed that his DNA was found on 39 different areas of her body, including her breasts, buttocks, and her thighs. However, his father, a 79-year-old man named William, he testified that Stephen had an alibi for the time that her body was lying there. He told the court that Stephen was at their home in Blantyre that whole weekend, they said that he had fallen on ice and hurt his arm, which left him in a sling. They said that they have no idea how his DNA could have possibly ended up all over Amber's body. But he too was found guilty on his charges. It was very clear that he shouldn't have had any kind of contact with Amber. They had no prior history of knowing each other. There was no time that they would have been around each other or had each other's DNA on them. There was no reason for his DNA to be all over her body like that whatsoever. So the DNA in his case pretty much speaks for itself. At the end of the trial, the judge said to Connor, quote, your sister, the last person she saw was you strangling her. It was depraved. You will pay a heavy price for that. Then he said to Stephen, you have been convicted of two horrible crimes. You came across a young girl who had been strangled to death and was naked. Instead of alerting the authorities, you handled her body and your DNA told the story. Be under no illusion what is also coming your way. As each man was taken away in handcuffs, neither of them showed any emotion. Throughout this trial, the jury heard just how vulnerable Amber Gibson was. She'd spent much of her life in foster care and was living in a children's home at the time of her killing. 
and the jury was told the one person that she should have trusted was her brother, Connor Gibson, who sat in the dock throughout the whole of the proceedings with no reaction and no remorse. I welcome the verdict today. It's the correct ver verdict. Um, it won't bring Amber back, but hopefully it will bring some comfort to our, our family and our friends. We also don't know the sentences for either man. Like I said, this case just went to trial just a few weeks ago, and they just came to their conclusion. So when more information comes out about their sentencing, I will let you all know. In the aftermath of this, Connor and Amber's family believe that the foster care system is also to blame for this murder. Connor and Amber's grandparents said that they tried to fight tooth and nail to get custody of the children once they were taken away from their mother and father's home. But they said that they would need to have some financial assistance from the government to take care of the children. They're frustrated that rather than just giving them some of the financial help that they needed to take care of Amber and Connor, they opted to send them to a stranger's house and pay even more money for them to end up with this other family. But by all accounts, the Nivens did everything that they could to provide for Connor and Amber, and there isn't really anything to say that if they were just given to their grandparents that anything would have changed. Again, we don't know the full story. I don't know exactly why they both ended up in, you know, homeless shelters. That's something that I wish we knew a little bit more about, but I wasn't able to find much more on that. But either way, I do think that Connor was just a very mentally messed up person. He clearly was not mentally healthy, and I think the circumstances in which he grew up played a big part in that. He watched his father beat on his mother from the time that he was born, and from there, he clearly showed signs of being mentally disturbed. I wish more was done to prevent this. I wish that people saw his disturbing behaviors and his, you know, vulgar humor and the things that he would talk about and the things that he said he was going through. His Facebook post was clearly a little bit of a cry for help. And the fact that nobody decided that maybe Connor needs a little bit of help with his mental health, I think that's also why this entire thing happened. But again, no matter what he went through in his life, this does not excuse what he did. This case is just such a tragic one because you absolutely would never guess that a girl's brother who went through so much with her could do something so horrendous to someone. We see in a lot of cases that a brother and sister go through something like this and the brother becomes sort of a protector to his little sister and that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Your older sibling should protect you when you're going through something very traumatic together. That is sort of their natural role that a lot of older siblings take on and the fact that not only did that not happen here but he turned around and did the same thing to her that everybody else had been doing to her in her life, it just, it's it's unforgivable. I literally have never seen such a case of a girl just never catching a break. She had to grow up watching her mother being beaten. She was raped at the children's home that she was at. She was raped and murdered by her brother and then her body was violated by some middle-aged man who saw her laying in a walking path naked and beaten. Like, are you serious? Even in death, she got the absolute shortest end of the stick and it's just heartbreaking, it's bone chilling, and it just makes me sick. But as you guys know, I could go on and on and on about just the misjustices that she faced, about everything that she went through, and how bad I feel for her and everybody who loved her, but that is where I'm going to end today's video. That is all the information that I have for today's case. I'm sure you're all leaving this case feeling just as gross as I do, and I don't blame you. It's a tough case to get through, but I do thank you all for listening to Amber's story because she deserves for her story to be told. But with that, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and go support my Facebook. All are linked down below as well. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, 
stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. 